behalf of the Patient Safety Authority, I would like to welcome you to this webinar titled Long-Term Care Emergency Preparedness Educational Series, Memorandums of Understanding. My name is Christine Bingman, and I will be your moderator for this program. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker for the webinar. Joanne Adkins is a registered nurse and senior infection preventionist for the Patient Safety Authority. Ms. Atkins is board certified in infection control and epidemiology, CIC, and is a fellow of the Association for Professionals in Infection Control and Epi Epidemiology. Ms. Atkins is a 2019 recipient of Apex Heroes of Infection Prevention Award for Education. She is a member of the Association for Professionals in Infection Control and Prevention and has served on the Member Services Committee, the Sigma Theta Tau International Nursing Honor Society, and the Pennsylvania Association Directors of Nursing Administration for Long-Term Care. Joanne, I will now turn the program over to you. Thank you, Christine. Welcome everyone to the eighth installment of the Long-Term Care Emergency Preparedness Webinar Series. Today's webinar is going to discuss Memorandums of Understanding. A Memorandum of Understanding is a good faith agreement among facilities to be used at the time of an emergency for the purpose of providing mutual aid. Memorandums of Understanding are intended to augment not replace your facility's disaster plan. An important thing to remember is no participant of a memorandum is required to provide medical supply, equipment, services, or personnel to another facility if those supplies are needed to meet their own needs. So here is our objectives for this webinar to review the difference between a Memorandum of Understanding, an MOU, and a Mutual Aid Agreement, to identify the elements of a Memorandum of Understanding, and to discuss the steps in developing and writing a Memorandum of Understanding. A Memorandum of Understanding is a written agreement made between two facilities, agencies, organizations, or other parties to accomplish a certain goal. This agreement is not binding like a contract, and neither party is legally obligated to perform the agreed upon actions. Memorandums of Understanding, written for an emergency situation, described how the parties involved will request and supply personnel, equipment, alternate facilities, supplies, and anything else that may be needed during or to recover from an emergency event. So some of the possible things that may require a memorandum of understanding. Transportation, if you must evacuate your facility, and who will provide supervision of the evacuated residents. Medical supplies and pharmaceuticals, if you are unable to obtain them for your supplier. Personnel or staffing assistance, or financial or legal liability. A mutual aid agreement is very similar to a memorandum of understanding in that it is a written non-contractual agreement between two parties. This agreement states that both parties will assist the other in an emergency or a time of need. But the key difference and the way that a memorandum of understanding differs from a mutual aid agreement is that the memorandum of understanding is not necessarily a mutual benefit agreement. The mutual aid agreement benefits both parties in that the agreement will provide aid to each other in a time of need, but a party that's entering into a memorandum of understanding may agree only to help the other party without any reciprocal aid. If a facility, if your facility is considering drafting a memorandum of understanding, 
with other entities, it is highly recommended that you discuss this with legal counsel and your local emergency management agency. These people can provide guidance on what is appropriate for inclusion in the Memorandum of Understanding. So what are the elements of a Memorandum of Understanding? Definitions of the key terms that are used within the agreement. You also need to define the roles and responsibilities of the individual parties. Any procedures for requesting or providing assistance. Types of acceptable payments, if any, in an emergency situation. Notification procedures and interoperable communications. Relationships with other agreements among jurisdictions. Workers' compensation insurance coverage. Treatment of liability and immunity. Recognition of qualifications and certifications. Sharing agreements as required. And one final part is authorized officials from each of the participating agencies will collectively approve and sign the Memorandum of Understanding. When it comes to developing and writing a Memorandum of Understanding, on the screen it lists the many the sections. You would have a section for introduction, purpose, scope, definitions, policy, user procedure requirements, maintenance, oversight, responsibility for standard operating procedure compliance, and updates. And we're going to briefly go through each of those sections. Introduction would briefly describe the need for this agreement. Who are the parties involved? And what is the importance of these two parties working together? When you're writing your introduction section, some of the things to consider is what resource or capability are we creating this memorandum for? Which agencies will be participating in this memorandum of understanding? And why is this necessary? And what are the agree agreements that are set forth by this memorandum? The purpose would briefly describe the necessity of the resource, including how and under what circumstances it will be used. When the purpose statement is being developed, then you do want to seriously consider when will this memorandum of understanding be utilized and how will it be used? The scope lists the parties that are involved in the agreement and their relationships. This can also include a level of command on who would take charge or if there's any government agencies involved. So when you're developing the scope of your agreement, think about who are the public safety, public service, or other agencies, both governmental or non-governmental, that will be using this resource and be part of this agreement. The definition section is a very important section because we all know the communication is vital, especially during an emergency. So when you're writing your memorandum of understanding, make sure you're defining terms associated with the resource to provide clarity and reduce uncertainty in the agreement. Think about what are the technical or operational aspects of the resource. And we don't like acronyms, but if there are acronyms that are used, make sure they are clearly defined so everyone understands what they are. And if there's any facility or community specific terms that are used, that you also define them within the Memorandum of Understanding so everybody is crystal clear on what's being discussed. The policy portion 
briefly describes under what circumstances the resource can be used. And this also includes who in your facility or in the agreement is authorized to use it, who can activate it, what is the timing, and anything else related to that memorandum of understanding. So as you're writing that in the back of your mind, think about when can this be used? And more importantly, when should it be used? Who within your facility has the ability to authorize the use of that agreement? And are there any specific operating procedures associated with the resource? Another part of the Memorandum of Understanding is user procedure requirements. This describes the obligations of being part of this agreement. And it may include what training would be required or would exercises need to be done to make sure everybody understands the process. What are the user requirements? So let's say you have a memorandum of understanding with a transportation agency in case you would have to evacuate your facility. It would be beneficial to set up an exercise to physically evacuate people from your facility to see if, if staff and also the agency that you have your agreement with understand the physical layout of your facility. If any special equipment would be required, say you have multiple stories, you're a three or four story facility, do we have equipment to bring residents downstairs? that sort of thing. So training and exercise are very important. What are the user requirements? And then another thing to think about is, are there any financial obligations to be considered? Such as, like I said, if you needed special equipment to, to move residents downstairs, is there equipment who would be responsible for obtaining that equipment and where would that equipment be located? Maintenance, this, the maintenance section mentions the designated parties responsible for maintaining any equipment, like I said, something to move residents, systems or licenses. When this portion is being developed, this is when you think about what are the maintenance requirements associated with participating in this memorandum of understanding? If there is any type of licensing required, who will hold that license? Your facility or the party you are in the agreement with? And if there is special equipment needed, then who will house and maintain that equipment? So those are all things that need to be discussed between the parties of the understanding while it is being developed. And then oversight. This section, the oversight section, describes how your facility is prepared for use of this resource. It, contain, it contains a description of the agencies that can provide recommendation that would affect the resource or policies. And also, how are you going to share this with the parties involved in this memorandum of understanding? This is when you look and see who oversees the use of this resource and enforces the requirements of it. What's the participation requirement for being in this memorandum of understanding? And if there are issues or changes that arise that affect recommendations, policies, or subsequent change to that memorandum, who then shares that information and receives approval from all the parties involved? And then responsibility for standard operating procedures. This is when you're going to assign responsibility to someone, one of the parties involved, to make sure that there is compliance with standard operating procedure. We always want best practice. So the, some of the things to think about with this, 
who's responsible for ensuring that the resource and the policies in it are followed and that personnel are trained appropriately? And how will this compliance be documented and carried out? And then the final section is updates. Describe how updates to this agreement will be made, who has the authority to make an update, and how will the participants be notified? So what you would think about writing this section is who has the authority within your facility and with the other party involved to provide an update. And will there be joint, will both parties work on the update or what type of approval will be required? Will you need new signature page verifying that there's understanding of these changes by all participating agencies? Like I said, it's always better to do things well in advance of an emergency than to try to do things and not have it pre-planned out. Planning forms relationships, and it's a very crucial element in getting through an emergency event in an even more effective manner. So as you know, if you've been on our webinars in the past, we always try to provide you with some resources to help you within your facility. So the tools we have for today is um, a link to the Homeland Security Writing Guide for a Memorandum of Understanding, the Asper Tracy Resource Document, Sample Memorandum of Understanding Agreement Templates, and then of course, the Infection Preventionist here at the Patient Safety Authority. So the first one, and here is the link for it, is Homeland Security, has developed a writing guide for a memorandum of understanding. This document is explains in detail, detail the importance of a memorandum of understanding and ver the various sections that I just briefly reviewed with you. It's laid out in a very structured manner. It is very easy to follow. I suggest that you take a look at this document and see if it can be beneficial to you within your facility. The second tool is from Health and Human Services. It's a healthcare emergency preparedness information gateway. That's what Tracy is. It provides information and resources to improve preparedness, response, and recovery. This document, and the link to it is on the screen there, contains links to Memorandum of Understanding templates, CMS-specific information for emergency preparedness. It has a lot of resources on there that are linked to this document that you can pull up and use within your facility. If you have never taken a look at the Asper Tracy documents, I suggest that you pull them up and take a good look at them. There is a wealth of information available through links to that document. And then the third tool comes from the Minnesota Department of Health. The link is on the screen. They have various templates for memorandums of understanding. They have, um, they have agreements for facilities for temporary shelter, they have agreements with, with transportation agencies, with emergency pa personnel. There are multiple templates available at this link that you may want to pull up, take a look at. You also should have memorandums of understanding within your facility. You may want to compare your memorandums of understanding with the resources that were provided on today's webinar, just to see if you have covered all your bases. Do we have a good basis for our memorandum of understanding? And then, of course, Christine, Amanda, and myself are always here as resources for you. We are all very strong, um, experienced infection preventionists. Infection prevention, as we said in previous webinars, play a role in emergency preparedness. 
but also in these webinars, we have been blessed with the assistance of what I'm calling my guest experts. And that is Jason Brown and Pamela Drake. Jason is the Director of Healthcare Emergency Management for Public Health Management Corporation. The Public Health Management Corporation, in cooperation with Pennsylvania's Department of Health, provides management and oversight to Pennsylvania's preparedness program. Jason has over 20 years experience in emergency preparedness and a very strong varied background. Pamela Drake is also a very experienced emergency manager with a history of working in hospital and healthcare industry, as well as government contracting and universities. She is the deputy director for healthcare emergency management at the Public Health Management Corporation and is an intermittent agency representative and public health advisor for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. So they are both on the webinar with us today. I am going to turn this program back over to you, Christine, for questions and answers. And also then if you, Jason, or you, Pam, have anything you would like to add, please feel free. So Christine, I'm gonna turn the program back over to you. Thanks, Joanne. That concludes the slide presentation portion of our program. Now we would like to begin our question and answer period. If you have questions, please type them in the Q&A box found at the bottom of your screen. Please click on the three dots, then click Q&A to open the Q&A panel and direct your questions to all panelists and we will try to answer as many questions as we can. So I have a question here, um, Joanne. My facility is concerned about being locked in to the agreement when we may not be able to keep our facility staffed and running. Is this agreement legally binding? No, this, as I said in the beginning of this webinar, this agreement is an agreement between two uh, facilities, but it is not a legally binding contract. The facility, the agreements there, if the facility can provide aid, that's what we would hope for, but they must also maintain their own services. So if they cannot, to keep their own facility running, if they cannot share supplies or provide shelter, then they would not be held by the agreement of having to take those residents in if you were evacuating, for example. Jason or Pam, do you have any comments on that? I would just add it's, it all depends on the way the, the mutual aid agreement itself is written. Um, I'll use the, the statewide mutual aid agreement that um, we administer through the, the healthcare coalitions. Um, that particular agreement is really non-binding. It basically says, yes, I can, if I can help, I will help, and here's how I will help. But if I can't help and can't provide that, there's no you know, legal requirement for me to do so. Uh, I'm just joining the agreement. And that's really the purpose behind the mutual aid agreement is setting those expectations of what you have uh, with your other providers um, that you rely on to um, complete your services. Thank you, Jason. And we have another question. This one, um, this, is, this goes to all of the panelists. So should someone else besides the NHA be able uh, or authorized to activate the MOU? I can start this one. This is Joanne. This goes back to any time you need to activate your emergency preparedness plan within your facility. I have spoken to facilities where all, where they had it stated only their administrative personnel or their nursing home administrator could activate the emergency preparedness plan. If your emergency would happen to occur while your administrator is within your facility, then that's appropriate. But many times emergencies happen on off hours or weekends where your only administrative personnel may be the house supervisor. And at that point in time, then that would be absolutely appropriate for her to activate this. Pam or Jason, do you have any thoughts? 
I, I would certainly agree with that, Joanne. You know, the, your lines of, of of delegation in your emergency operations plan uh, are specific to that facility. So, um, whatever um, the owner administrator is willing to delegate to others in off shifts um, should be clearly outlined in that EOP. Uh, and uh, we should be following the chain of command within our organization and in our lines of authority of what I can and can't do in the event of an emergency. Yes, we always want to be able to move people to a safe uh, place and safe environment, um, but that decision to completely evacuate and abandon the facility, I would hope that we were waiting for the nursing home administrator to make that uh, determination once we move to a safe area. Thank you, Jason. This concludes our webinar.